Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, being on this call, and we are learning about the missionary journeys of Paul. I had mentioned to us that while he was at uh, Asia, he was able to impact the different churches of Asia, which are later uh, talked about in Revelation. So let me just quickly show you the the map of those seven churches. Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm sure these names are familiar. So Ephesus is where he was. Uh, but then, you know, these are the names that we see in Revelation. Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So uh, his ministry was uh, primarily in, in Ephesus, but the impact was in the entire region and we know that uh, you know all these powerful churches were raised up okay and earlier i have explained uh, though it says asia this is more like uh, where turkey i think present day turkey is so uh, that is the region that was covered all right now let's come back to what we were discussing. Yes. Uh, so before we move on to 20, chapter 20, um, another observation that we have was there were names, right, of uh, more people. So earlier, like when you begin. Acts 19. Yeah, Timothy and Erastus, um, he's, he sent into Macedonia, but he himself stayed for a time in uh, Asia, Ephesus. So we saw those names. Then who are the other names? We saw names like uh, Gaius, Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. Notice the team has actually grown larger. Luke never mentioned, mentioned it uh, sort of, you know, very how do you put it, like very clearly or specifically to us. But our understanding is there are more people now. And uh, that's the beauty of it. So as you're traveling, the church, number of people who are believing is increasing, number of, number of people who are serving is increasing, number of people who are leading is increasing. So you, got, you have a few more names here. Then uh, who else? Yeah, so here these are the uh, the prominent names. Now let's go to Acts 20. And uh, what are some names that we will read there? So as we start off from the beginning of the passage, we see here, uh, so the uproar had ceased. Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll quickly read that uh, section. We'll see a few more names. Now, when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. So notice that same pattern. They go back to the older places, Macedonia. Which are the churches in Macedonia? Which is a like pr prominent church in Macedonia? A lot of things happen in Macedonia. Any 
be what? Which one? You can always turn the pages of your Bible. It's as simple as that. Or maybe if you're looking online, then go back to the previous couple of verses and see. It is the prominent church of Macedonia. Do you remember the whole prison experience? Yeah. Yes. Correct. The Macedonian call. And then where did he go? Where was the uh, major ministry? And they got imprisoned for it. Yes. Yes. The jailer and his household. But what is the name of that city? Church in Philippi, Church in Berea. Correct. Very good. Thank you, Lyndon. So uh, it is the uh, Church of Philippi where all this happened. And then they were imprisoned. And remember, they had to leave and they had to uh, rush. They went to a place called as Thessalonica after that. Thessalonica also, they had a lot of problems. So then again, they had to leave that from that place. And then they went on to Berea. So this is the journey. Right? Second missionary journey. Uh, great. So now coming back here, we notice that after his time in Ephesus and impacting the region of Asia, he goes, he departs to go to Macedonia. Same places, Philippi, Thessalonica, Beria, all those places. Now, when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. So uh, which place do we have today in modern Greece? Where did he minister in Greece? It's become a little bit of a geography lesson. <laughs> History, geography. Athens or Athens. Okay. So uh, that's the place where he went and uh, shared regarding God. So that he went there, he stayed there for three months, it says. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria. Uh, Syria, what do we have in Syria? Antioch of Syria. So his home church is in Syria. Okay. Uh, anyway, so when uh, he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So there's like a change of route. Now, notice the names. You'll find so many people who have actually joined the team of Paul. So there are some names here. So Pater of Beria accompanied him to Asia. Also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians. So do you see from each place there are leaders who have come up now and they are serving together. Now, when you look into the lives of these people and their backgrounds, even that is very interesting. So it is said here, Aristarchus and Secundus, okay, of Thessalonians. So Aristarchus apparently is a name of somebody who's from uh, uh, like a, a royal background or someone who's from a very wealthy family. So that would be Aristarchus. But Secundus. Secundus is a name of uh, a slave, uh, like a slave person <coughs> in those days. So can you imagine the impact that the gospel has had? There are people on Paul's team who are who belong to uh, people of different sections of society, languages, ages. So it's amazing, amazing how so many people are now serving the Lord and uh, the way Paul actually equipped them. So uh, what kind of equipping did Paul do? He taught the word that we are very clear because he spent a lot of time teaching the word. And he also discipled people we can understand through his own life because he took people along with him. He let people observe his life. And Paul went through uh, so many ups and downs. Uh, and some uh, times it seems like 
miracles are happening through his life deliverances are taking place through his life but on the other hand uh, there is so much of opposition where even paul is scared for his own life so uh, we see that whatever journey paul was going through uh, he was open about it he let people see it he let people go with him and in this way the people around him were actually built up and discipled because they were able to look at the life of paul look at the life of a leader and see oh his ups his downs how does he deal with it you know all of that uh, so it's beautiful to uh, really see how uh, uh, he was ministering the word proclaiming the word demonstrating the power of the sup uh, supernatural and uh, also discipling people through his own life he took people along gave opportunities right he didn't try to monopolize on the opportunities that he had so a lot of uh, 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 lovely lessons to learn so aristarchus secondus of thessalonians gaius of uh, derb or derby and timothy timothy of timothy of where is timothy from we we saw that also if you can recall Toros. He comes from Toros. Uh, Troas. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, you could not really. He he hailed from another uh, place, uh, uh, Lupeka. Do you remember we discussed that he took no. Timothy, he forcefully, uh, yeah, Someone. he forcefully circumcised Timothy so that he will be accepted by people later on in his ministry. Lystra. Lystra. There you go. Yeah, Lystra is the place that Timothy is from. Okay, so Timothy. Uh, and uh, Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. So uh, I, I'm hoping you kind of remember the map, you know, Galat Galatia, Macedonia, Achaia, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the Asia region. Uh, so the, the journey is going on. So there are people now who are uh, with... They are waiting for him at Troas. Okay, so they are there in Troas. We sailed from Philippi after the days of uneven bread and five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. So when it says we stayed seven days, who's who's with them? Luke, Luke, Luke. Luke, correct. Luke, because he's the one who's writing. And that's why when he says we, he's included in that trip. And uh, seven days they are uh, in a place called as Troas. So in Troas, again, some amazing ministry happens. Okay, let's see what this ministry is. Um, uh, would somebody like to read it? And then I'll point out a couple of uh, key points here from verse 7 to verse 12, Acts 20. Read. Yes, please. Acts chapter 20, verses 7 to 12. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lambs in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a, win and in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him said, Do not trouble yourself, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till they break, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not not a little comforted okay. wow so interesting uh, raises a lot of questions in our minds questions such as um, you know why why was this young man so sleepy eutychus he was sinking into a sleep 
does it prove that Paul was very boring when he was, you know, uh, in his preaching style? We don't know. We don't know. These are all questions that people ask. But uh, some commentators, they say that uh, apparently people would work through the day and then come for the meetings in the night. So that is why he was tired. He probably had a, uh, a lot of work that he had done. And uh, instead of resting, he had showed up at this meeting. And uh, we also observe, it says the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. So that again shows us some key things, uh, such as, you know, when we look at uh, the seven days of creation, uh, the first six days God created and on the seventh day God rested. So there's this whole argument about first day, seventh day, which is the right day of, of the Sabbath and day to rest and all. But what we generally go by is what we see in the book of Acts, because here it says on the first day of the week. So that's why like Sunday is the day that we uh, usually go to church, we worship. But Yes, there are certain countries where they pick a different day where they uh, worship the Lord. But then, you know, it's not necessarily about the day. So that first day of the week is a mention over here. Uh, and then it says the disciples came together to break bread. Also tells us that they probably had communion um, every Sunday. So it was like the church service when they all came together. Paul was going to go the next day. So seems like he wanted to sail too many things. Uh, and uh, so he went on and on. It says, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. I wonder if anybody preaches till midnight, uh, you know, in our generation, whether people will stay or what. Uh, they would just prefer an online service maybe, right? <laughs> to just stay home. But in this case, they did not have any options. They went up to the so-called upper room or space and uh, they are all gathered and Paul is going on and on and on till midnight. He's sharing the different things on his heart, preaching the word. Then what happens? This man who sat near the window, Eutychus, sinking into a deep sleep, overcome by sleep. Uh, when Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. So the scripture itself says that he is a dead man. Okay. Uh, this is all so challenging, isn't it? Uh, but thank God for the power of the, the spirit that uh, God's people ministered with. Do you remember anyone else whom, uh, who was resurrected in the book of Acts? Dorokas. Yeah. Dorcas, correct, correct. So who ministered to Dorcas? I think it's Peter. Peter, very right. So, so sort of similar miracles that you see, you know, Peter is going, doing all these things. Paul is doing all these things. So resurrection this time around, uh, this person dies. And uh, I mean, I can't even imagine what, what went through Paul. Like people would blame him. Your sermon is too long, Paul. You shouldn't have preached. Look now, somebody fell down and they even died because of your sermon. Okay. But um, he just goes down. Thank God that, uh, you know, he understood that he can minister to him. So he fell on him and embracing him said, do not trouble yourselves for his life is in him. So this man is now resurrected. Uh, and look at, the, look at the focus of Paul, verse 11. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even until daybreak, he departed. So after raising the dead man, Paul is continuing with the sermon, right? Till morning, many hours again, he preaches, only then he leaves Troas. Uh, and, you know, thank God, you know, this young man is alive and the people are also happy. So, uh, yeah. Somewhat uh, strange what happened in Troas, but great to see the power of God. Now, from Troas, they move on to a place known as uh, Miletus. So it's basically about just moving. So not so much of, uh, you know, some, some key takeaway in, in the next couple of verses. But maybe someone can read it. Someone different, please. So I think uh, Lubega has read and... Uh, Jeffina has read, so uh, someone else could kindly go ahead and read from verse 13 to verse 16.
Acts chapter 20, verse 13 to 16. Yes. Then we went ahead to the sheep and sailed to us. Then we went ahead to the sheep and sailed to us. Okay, so uh, seems then, like there's, there's some doubling up. Um, so, Zeli, I would request you to continue, please. And then uh, whoever wants to read can read the next time. So you can continue now. Acts 20, verse 13 to 16. Then we went ahead to the ship and sailed to Assos. They were intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board and came to Mitlini. He, uh, we sailed from there, and the next day came opposite Chios. The following day, we arrived at Samos, Samos and stayed in Trogolium. The next day, we came to Miletius, for Paul had decided to sell past officials so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Mm. All right. Yes, thank you, Zeli. Thank you so much for reading uh, those verses. And as we can observe, there are a good number of uh, names of places. So I think it will be better for me to just show you a map. That way you can register the places in your mind. All right, I hope uh, this is noticeable. Let me make it bigger. Yes, all right. So remember, we said, you know, it starts off from Antioch, the upper regions of Galatia, spends a lot of time in uh, Ephesus, and then, you know, he wants to go to Macedonia. So he goes to Macedonia. He spends some time over there. We just discussed. Philippi, Thessalonica, Beria, um, you know, all, the, all those cities. And uh, uh, Achaean region is also kind of shown here. But then he comes back to Troas. So let's observe his journey back. He's coming back over here. You can see him at Troas. So this is where the, the miracle of uh, raising Eutychus happened. And just now Zeli read, she read the uh, Assos, then uh, Mytilene, Chios, Samos, Miletus, right? So this is where he is finally at. Now, uh, something uh, something that we will notice is that, you know, he can always go to Ephesus, right? It's so close by. Ephesus is just about here. But because of the <coughs> opposition, that arose, it is not safe for Paul to go to Ephesus. Uh, so there's something that he will plan to do right now in order to minister uh, to the people, the elders. So by now, what has happened is there are um, you know, two years he taught there, and then you know he went on for this uh, visit to Macedonia, and also it's been a while, uh, and therefore we can imagine that the church has become strong, and there are many leaders in the church. One of his one of his desires is to encourage the people or the leaders of Ephesus, just the way he went and encouraged in other regions. He wants to encourage in Ephesus, but it's kind of dangerous to go back into Ephesus because you remember Demetrius and all the uproar that took place. So what is he going to do now? We will see that uh, he will, from Miletus, he'll call for the leaders of Ephesus to come to him because uh, he obviously cannot go there. Now let's go ahead. Let's look at, uh, okay, where is that? Yeah, this one. So from Miletus, once he talks to the leaders of Ephesus, he'll journey back. So you can see the arrows coming through, uh, you know, uh, Rhodes, Patara, and then he'll go to Tyre, Tyre oh, I know how you pronounce it, then uh, Ptolemaeus, Caesarea, and finally to 
Jerusalem. So this time around, the third missionary journey, as you would see, starts at Antioch and it ends at Jerusalem. So <coughs> let's continue and see what exactly he ministers to the uh, uh, leaders in Miletus. So we are now in Miletus. Okay, so uh, it says, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you. Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But not, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Okay, uh, And uh, you know, then he'll go on to say many different things, but let me just share from this passage first and then I'll go to the next. So what he's saying is two things. One is, he says, leaders of Ephesus, you know how I lived. You know, um, you know how I served through good times and bad times uh, and I drew people to the Lord. That's the first thing. Second thing, he says, God is speaking to me or the Holy Spirit is telling me that chains await me in every city. That means that there are tribulations or persecutions which are waiting for Paul. And, uh, you know, when we journey with God, we can understand his plans for our lives. So Paul was journeying so closely with the Lord that in the next couple of years, the things that were going to take place in his life, he was kind of aware by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And so he's actually telling the elders what is going to happen to him. And he's saying that, you know, if I go to Jerusalem, then uh, I don't know what, what all dangerous things are going to happen to me. But he is willing to be obedient to God. That's why in verse 24, he says, none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So, this is so similar to the uh, apostles whom we saw in the first few chapters of the book of Acts. Full of boldness. They were not even afraid of their own for their own lives. They were ready to preach the gospel. Come what may. Do you remember the angel comes? It rescues Peter and John and says, go back to the uh, temple and start preaching again. Boldly they go back. They're not afraid about what might happen to them. So something for us to notice is uh, these people were so brave. They were so passionate. They were so committed. Life or death, they were willing to serve the Lord. And that's what Paul is saying. I know what's going to happen. Whatever is going to happen is not good, but I'm not afraid. I'm here to do what God has called me to do. Now, let's move on. Uh, so he's still preaching to the leaders. So, you know, you can imagine the scene. And remember, I mentioned to us there is a movie, uh, Acts of the Apostles. So I would recommend that you see it because they've tried their best to make it look as it may not be exactly how it was back in the uh, days of Paul, but they've done their best. So you'll notice there uh, that, you know, there's a gathering of the leaders and Paul is actually talking to them. He's in tears because it's, it's full of love. He knows he won't come back. He knows he is not going to see them again in his spirit. So what are the emotions involved in talking to the leaders? 
that's the picture we get over here so everything which is on his heart he is ready to pour it out to them because he truly loves them he has served them so hard and uh, he is not going to see them again so what are the other things that he mentions from verse 25 he says and indeed now i know that you all among whom i've gone preaching the gospel of god will see my face no more therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Okay, so what is he saying? He's saying, uh, I may not see you. One thing I'm sure of, I did my job as an evangelist and as a teacher. So he's saying, I am innocent of the blood of all men. It simply means that their eternal future is at stake which is why we have to preach the gospel. He has done it. He has already done it. He never let go of any opportunity. So he's saying, I did my job as an evangelist. And he's also saying, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So this is also a beautiful passage, a uh, beautiful phrase, whole counsel of God, meaning I've taught you well. I've taught you thoroughly. What is the whole counsel of God? Any idea? Any thoughts on that? whole council okay entire gospel of jesus christ all right is it possible to to uh, teach or preach the partial council of the word of god okay very true uh, that's already done so any examples of let's say the partial council as compared to the whole council. See, Paul is so brave and so confident. I taught you everything. That's what he's saying. So what is this whole council? I do think yeah. that uh, yes, yes. This is when people, this is when people are trying to preach, but they, they, they cut out some issues. For instance, there are people, especially some churches. I don't want to want to mention some, but uh, there are some churches which mix their traditions or their own culture into the religion. For instance, mm. you see, like we have two sacraments mm. that are preached in the Bible. Yes. Uh, the, the one of uh, baptism and the one of Holy Communion. But you will find some people have also the prayer of the sick, they have confirmation, they have so many. Anything you add to the gospel becomes something different. It, it's no longer mm -hmm. the gospel alone. That's what yes. I can say for now. Sure. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Lubiga. So, uh, what you're saying is that sometimes uh, there are people who are preaching untruth or let's say even incomplete truth which will lead to error in the lives of people so uh, as far as paul is concerned he has made sure that he has given the full picture of what the word says so that tells us to be responsible teachers of the word uh, i think colossians 2 15 if i'm not wrong or i know what that uh, scripture passage is uh, let me give you the right reference Okay, yeah, uh, oh, Second Timothy 2.15, where <coughs> it says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need, need, needed, uh, be, need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What is rightly dividing the word of truth? So when we teach, uh, we, we are responsible to ensure that um, it's interpreted correctly and the truth is uh, taught correctly. So then, you know, we, we may need to assess every subject um, in, a, in a proper manner and then present it to the people because what happens when people hear the teaching of God's word, they apply it because the word of God is for us to live out. So, as a teacher, if we are not rightly dividing or rightly interpreting 
the word then it may lead to wrong application and if it leads to wrong application it affects people's lives so these are all the issues and uh, when paul says the whole counsel of the word of god as uh, you know lubega pointed out and even jevina was sharing that uh, uh, paul says right uh, and i think it is in philippians philippian uh, philippians 1 verse 15 where uh, he says some indeed preach christ even from envy and strife and some also from goodwill so there are people who can preach with the wrong motives only half the truth okay but uh, these are all the partial uh, way of speaking the word of god we must go away from it now uh, if we are not careful we may also we may do that intentionally or unintentionally for example you know i always wonder about the teaching of grace uh, we talk about how god's grace has saved us uh, and uh, you know god's grace is upon our lives yes all that is correct but just because we are speaking about god's grace it doesn't mean that a believer should not live responsibly or righteously uh, because in some teachings it seems like that like you do anything you want god's grace covers you you know god will god forgives you you don't have to be ashamed it becomes very one sided but if we go back to uh the verse that comes to my mind i'll just tell tell us yeah okay john chapter 1 uh, and uh, verse 14 where uh, scriptures tell us the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth okay so grace goes hand in hand with what with truth so we can't just say that you know uh god forgives god forgives god forgives whereas the truth about righteous living the truth about uh, you know uh, walking wisely with god those things cannot be hidden from the people if we do that it becomes one sided so uh, when we look at this term whole counsel of god there's so much we can talk about it because what paul was saying was very very important he's saying the way i have preached to you you have understood in wholeness how to worship correctly how to live correctly i didn't have the wrong motives neither did i give you the wrong interpretation of the word of god so when you apply it you will reap the good results of the uh, you know what the word brings to you so look at his confidence how he's how he's talking this is the kind of ministry that he did among the people and then he uh, look at his pastoral heart now so far he said uh, as an evangelist i have preached i have as a teacher i have taught now he's saying verse 28 therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the holy spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of god which he purchased with his own blood now it's a very pastoral uh, kind of uh, a, an instruction there because he's saying the flock of god the flock of god is who the people of god uh, so he is using a terminology like shepherd and flock because a shepherd takes care of his sheep so we have to take care of god's people he's telling the leaders look leaders god is the one he has given these people to us uh, and uh, who made us pastors or who made us overseers the holy spirit not we ourselves but it was the work of the holy spirit that you are a leader you are a pastor over them uh, and he says always remember when dealing with god's people that they are not you know sometimes we say oh my people or my uh, church but actually technically if you look at it they have only been entrusted to us because these are god's people whom he has purchased with his own blood <clears throat> and it is the holy spirit who has made us overseers upon god's people so it reveals the kind of responsibility that we carry upon our shoulders so these are all things that he is he is uh, trying to 
make the leaders understand that the responsibility that you carry has come from God and these are God's people. So what does he say? He says, shepherd the church. Shepherd the church. We can talk so much about it. Right? What is shepherding? You Shepherd meaning you have to guide them, lead them, nurture them, protect them. So much work is involved in shepherding God's people so that we can lead them in the purposes of God. So these are the instructions, departing instructions that Paul speaks to the leaders. Verse 29. He says, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. So he's also aware of times where uh, false teachers, false prophets will rise from among the people. Now, if you go and study the writings of Apostle Peter, Apostle John, all of them warn about times when uh, False doctrines will arise. It's nothing new. Even in Paul's time, he's saying, be ready. There will be people who don't have the right motivation, who don't have the right teaching, but they'll still be kind of serving God. Okay. But you've got to be very alert. After I go, you'll suddenly find such people in your midst. And verse 30, also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Verse 31, therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So the way he has prepared God's people in the word, in the spirit is that even when these tough days come with so much confusion, they will be able to stand. They will be able to, uh, uh, you know, fulfill what God wants them to do. So I think I'm just going to stop here. Uh, we will look at Paul's speech or his um, instructions to the leaders some more in the next class. If there's any anything that you want to discuss about, we can do that before we close in prayer. Yeah, so uh, Apostle Paul comes across as such a passionate person, isn't it? So passionate um, and uh, so committed. What a transformation from a person who's a, a persecutor to one who's proclaiming about the same Jesus. And uh, we thank God for you know these testimonies. Uh, may we also um, learn from the lives of Paul and many others and live passionately for God. So let's just close with a word of prayer. Uh, I open it up for anyone to go ahead and lead, please. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for this time. Thank you for teaching us from your word. Lord, we pray that um, help us also to be passionate to be on fire for you, O oh God, and always preach the whole gospel, God, and to bring people to your word, to your truth, O oh God, and help us to um, uh, not dilute at any point of time, O oh God, but help us to be very diligent in what you have given to us, O oh God. We pray, Lord God, that we would be accountable to you and we would do it uh, every every work that we do, oh God, let it bring glory to your name, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this time of learning. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, have a blessed weekend. And uh, those of us who are serving you know, in churches, uh, may the Lord uh, strengthen you that you may see his power and his glory. So bye for now. And uh, take care.